We begin with today's developments on foreign interference. The NDP leader was set to read an unredacted version of the report alleging MPs wittingly involved with foreign state actors. But is Jagmeet Singh willing to release those details openly in the House? Have a listen. I will not do anything that jeopardizes national security. That would undermine the whole point of having the work being done. So I don't want to in any way jeopardize national security. And so I'll be very clear on that. I will follow the rules regarding what is in the best interest of Canada as a country. I think what's missing in all this is that leaders aren't putting Canada first. We're seeing Pierre Polyev put his own interests first. Because it might be embarrassing for him to learn that a foreign government was involved in the selection of him as leader. But his embarrassment should not trump the interests of the country. That should be the most important thing. We're also hearing today from the chair of the committee responsible for that report. David McGinty says it's unfortunate to see so much focus on what he calls the small elements of that report. And he says national security is not a game. The stakes are huge. Our democracy is on the line. Our rule of law is on the line. Of transnational repression is on the line. Our diaspora communities are on the line and being victimized. All of this is called out. It's a major clarion call for action. All right, so for more on foreign interference, let's welcome Stephanie Carvin, Associate Professor at the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton University. Stephanie, good to see you again. I want to start with what was this extended uh, exchange with the committee chair David McGinty and reporters today about the ENSACOP report. What stood out for you? So I think the thing that stood out was that he did not dispute the interpretation of the report by Elizabeth May, and he s described the comments, or at least what he had read of the comments, as helpful, right? Um, and so I think that that's important. It does give us some insight that you know some of the most serious allegations in the report about you know witting uh, cooperation between members of parliament and uh, the you know <laughs> agencies of foreign governments is or perhaps not as dire as we've perhaps been led to believe um, and that he expressed support that you know there was a lot of interest in this report and uh, looked forward to uh, you know parliament taking a role in, in perhaps correcting some of the issues. Uh, that, 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 I think, is probably the most significant thing. The only other thing that I thought was perhaps a bit strange was that he said this was not never meant to be a public communications tool when it is absolutely a public communications tool. I don't know what else you would call it. He had a press conference. There's a report that everyone can read in either official language. It is absolutely fundamentally a public communications tool, and I hope the MPs on the committee would be treating it as such. Right, and, and he was spending a lot of time trying to put this report into context of the overall foreign interference issue. There's been a lot of talk about whether focusing on the names of certain MPs or parliamentarians is really helping with that debate. Do you think we're losing the overall plot of what needs to happen next? I do think the allegations were serious. So even if we lost the plot for a little bit, I can it's, it's understandable why that happened. I mean, when I first read that, the first thing I was thinking was, Oh my goodness! <laughs> Who are these people, and what are they doing? Um, so this was this was these were pretty serious allegations, right? And I think that as a result, um, it's understandable that there were people wanting to know the names of people who may be betraying the country, right? I mean, that's a, one of the most serious allegations I think you could possibly make against someone who sits in Parliament. So, but that being said, yes, and I, I would refer back to Elizabeth May's comments yesterday, which I do think were were helpful. I mean, so long as um, what she said was accurate and and I will take her ability to read the report um, as, as being strong. Um, but what she said yesterday is, like, yes, okay, the worst allegations aren't as bad as what we perhaps thought and what had been bandied about. But she also said that we have a real problem here and there's other problems in areas. She mentioned the nominee process, right? The nominations processes that are that can be targeted. Um, the idea that money may be being cycled into our elections and that's a real problem um, that, we, that we need to address. In fact, it would be a violation of the Canadian Elections Act. Uh, then as well, I mean, the idea of there's certain community organizations that, that, that do this. So the idea that Canada is a target and parliamentarians are targets for foreign governments 
things I think is really fundamentally important. And this is where Parliament absolutely should be focusing its attention. Just because, okay, good news, there's not traitors in the midst, but at the end of the day, um, there is clearly some um, other serious problems which are still compromising our democracy right now. So given what we've heard this week then from political parties on what to do next, I want to I guess ask you about how confident you are in action being taken because we have this push now for the public inquiry to look at these allegations. Uh, Elizabeth May telling us yesterday, look, I think politicians, political leaders, parliamentarians need to be doing this, not pushing it off onto the inquiry. So how do you see that playing out? That's a really important point, and I think I agree with with Elizabeth May. Uh, the fact is, I don't see any value in pushing this on to an inquiry. An inquiry, we should say, that's just already operating under tremendous strain, right? The timelines given to the inquiry were very, very short. Um, they, all, they have a limited staff. They have limited resources. And it's not clear to me they're getting any extra resources to deal with this entirely new burden of work. It also just seems that, you know, by kicking it to the um, the, the inquiry, Inquiry, that they're just simply having the inquiry redo the work that NZCOP has already done. So, so why why are we doing this? So uh, that that's been a particular point of frustration to me. Um, there does seem to be a lack of willingness for Parliament to take it serious. I mean, I'm I'm happy to hear that you know Elizabeth May read the report. It's my understanding Jagmeet Singh will be reading the report in the next coming days and hopefully offering his interpretation of it. Um, Yves Blanchette as well. That's going to be very important. But uh, Conservative uh, leader Pierre Polyev is saying he, he has no interest in reading a secret report that he can't talk about. I don't don't really know why he thinks that, but it's not not here to do any kind of uh, partisan speculation. But um, there's a lot of areas where I think we could see Parliament uh, do more, including uh, particularly around the nominations processes. Um, Elizabeth May mentioned that yesterday, but that's also been a constant theme in the reports, not just the NZ COP report that we got uh, last week, but also in the um, other reports of that, like the, the the actual interference commission itself highlighted nominations as a particular point of weaknesses, but we don't see any willingness from parties to really change the way that business is done in this very gray and murky area. Okay, I wanna finish with you on this. Uh, because of the field you're in, international affairs, you know, how do you think, I guess we could use the word adversaries, but officials from other governments such as China and India, as they're watching this debate unfold in Canada, seeing these reports, seeing some evidence put on the public record about this, what do you think they're thinking right now? That's a really interesting question. I mean, to be honest, I haven't seen that much report. You know, given the serious allegations that are in this report, I haven't seen a lot of reporting in the foreign press about um, some of the things that have been said. So that's kind of interesting. Um, I think I'm not so much worried about Canada's adversaries because they're going to continue doing what they do. I, I suppose I'm more concerned about our allies, right? Canada is a member of the Five Eyes Alliance. We share intelligence and we import more intelligence than we actually um, give out to our allies as well. And we need to be seen as running a tight ship in order to be a trusted member of that alliance. And if we're not doing that, this will be a problem. So um, some of these reports highlight problems that you know we just so far have not been willing to solve. Like there's discussion about you know how we use intelligence in court proceedings is a huge weakness that needs to be addressed. We call this the intelligence to evidence problem. Probably not enough time to go into that, but that's something that needs to be legislatively fixed. Um, the fact that party leaders seem to be reluctant to protect their own parties from this kind of influence must be being seen as bizarre. I think they'll be very happy that Canada is taking some steps in passing a foreign interference act, and certainly our adversaries will be looking wait for ways to get around that particular act. But to me, it's just as important to be seen uh, in the eyes of our allies as being responsible partners in, in our intelligence relationships as it is with our adversaries showing a, a, a willingness to resolve the problems that we have as well. All right, Stephanie Carver, and always appreciate your analysis. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you.